hey, man, we're in a series about grace, and, and I, I want to tell you something that's exciting. Last week, in all three services, we had between 40 and 50 people give their life to Jesus Christ. Isn't that awesome? Man, that never gives a... No, see, that's how you clap when they get your order right at Sonic. 40 or 50 people that were dead that have been made alive in Christ Jesus, man. That never gets old. When you hear about somebody getting saved and you, it never gets old, man. I'm telling you, I love it. And we've already had uh, three or four people have their lives changed today. So we're believing good things to happen in this service. But last week I talked about the uh, righteousness of grace. Tonight, this morning I want to talk to you, boot, talk to you, boot. <laughs> the, uh, what's this all boot from Canada all of a sudden? Um, the immutability of grace. Now, I know nobody walks around using the word immutability a lot in our society, but all that word means is unchangeable. He's unchangeable, and it's an attribute of God. How do you know that God's unchangeable? It doesn't matter what you do. He doesn't change. There's no shade in him. Come on. He's constant. Now, you know you can't trust you. You'll get up in the morning, like 9 o'clock, like, well, you know what? I'm going to give me some Mexican food for lunch, and here come lunchtime, and you eating a hamburger. You can't even trust you with lunch decisions. Come on, somebody. But God is unchangeable, and it's an attribute of God, and, and, and there are two attributes of grace that I want to talk about today, two unchangeable truths. This is what the book of Hebrews tells us, and if we understand these truths, they become strong encouragement and an anchor for our soul when hard times come. And, and, and think about we're going through a difficult time. Our nation is going through a difficult time right now. We need to know who we believe in more now today than ever. Amen? Amen. And, and it's, if, if you don't know what you believe in, you're going to get cost, uh, tossed to and fro if you don't have an anchor for your soul. Now, your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. And when we go through a rough battle, where does the battle start? In our mind, in our will, in our emotions, we're all over the place. You, nobody irrational makes a good decision. Nobody irrational makes good uh, choices. And so you, you ever been on a boat and, and you throw your anchor out? And, and Johnny and Chris, we, we go to the lake with them sometime uh, at, at Lake Allen Henry, and, and we'll throw the, the, the anchor out, and then we'll just jump in the water or what those little island things that float or, or do whatever. And the next thing we know... That boat's kind of moved. You're like, oh, shoot, man, I thought we anchored. But the problem is we didn't anchor it down properly or well. And the reason I tell you that, if you don't know in whom you have believed that he is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above, beyond all you can ask, when you go through a rough time, your soul, if it's not anchored properly, it's going to be all over the place. You're not going to know what to do, and you don't know what's true, what's not true, and, and you'll let other people start telling your truth. That's the worst thing you can do is let somebody else tell you what your truth is. You better know what it is. I don't want nobody in this room to come up to me after church and say, Pastor Todd, I have got the best ribs. I nobody want to hear about it. I want to taste it. Okay? Show up with a plate of ribs. Don't come back telling me, like, I got the best. Who cares? I don't care. That you think that, I care that I taste that. Come on. And then when I taste that, I'll be like, I'm going to need one more. One more. Like last night, man, we had a, a staff greet, uh, gathering, and we're all together. We're hanging out, staff. And somebody brought watermelon, but nobody told me that watermelon came. And watermelon is like one of those things that like heaven's going to have for sure, I know. And <laughs> y'all don't ruin heaven for me, Okay. So they come and say, hey, Pastor Todd, you know we got watermelon? And I was like, no, it's just out there on the counter. And I was like, uh, it's been on the counter for like an hour. Yeah, but it's still watermelon. Yeah, but I want that watermelon when you bite in it till your teeth hurt because it's so cold. If y'all don't, see, y'all ain't never been fat. When you're fat, you know what tastes good. I can tell none of y'all been fat, or you haven't been fat long enough. When you get big, you'll be like, oh, that's what he was talking about, all right? So... The question I want to ask you today is when a storm comes, will your anchor hold? When rough times hit you, 
will your anchor hold? And, and if we don't understand these two unchangeable truths about grace that, that we're going to talk about today, when a storm comes, it's going to blow you all over the place. So you got to know what grace is. And because and serious damage can be done to you. And sometimes that damage can be so devastating that many people don't make it back to the cross. They get hurt, they get messed up, and they get this image that God's not a good God. Or they go to a church and they get hurt in church. And Can I tell you, it is never people's fault about who God is. People are people, but I understand that the churches are stepping up and we represent God and then they treat you bad. I'm just trying to tell you, God doesn't change no matter what people do. And I got to get this in your spirit today because I may fail you. I, I may mess, I'll never fail you on, on food. I will always lead you in the right direction on what good. Trust a fat boy when he talks about food. <laughs> Gary, you got my back. Triple G's got my back. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 6 and see what I'm talking about. Verse 13 says this. For when God made a promise to Abraham because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself saying, surely blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater. And an oath of confirmation, or an oath for confirmation is for them uh, an end of all disputes. So in other words, it's saying, if you swear by someone greater, it ends all conversation, okay? It ends all disputes. Thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of the promise, the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things, those are two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, that we may have a strong consolation, that we may have strong encouragement who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Now remember, our soul is our mind, our will, and our emotions, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the uh, order of Melchizedek. Now, I want you to remember high priest forever, because that's going to be key to this message today. Now, last week I told you how God came to Abraham and and said, given your religious upbringing, and we talked about, because this happens to us sometimes, uh, depending upon how we were raised or what church we may have grew up in or if we didn't even grow up in church, but depending upon that, given your background, he told Abraham, given what you know of me, uh, what I'm about to tell you is going to be tough for you to believe because you've heard that I've come to condemn you. And I could, but I didn't come to condemn you. And you've heard, Abraham, that I've come to judge you. And I could judge you, but I haven't come to judge you. What I came to do is to bless you. And Abraham believed that, and God put righteousness in his account. Everybody remember that from last Sunday? If you didn't, you can go back and watch it or catch it on podcast. So Hebrews right now is telling us about that covenant that God made with Abraham. And it gives us just a little bit more of an insight of what happened there. Because it says that God swore to himself because he's the greater, it would end all disputes. Now, that's the whole reason when we go to court today and we put our hand on the Bible and we swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. Some of y'all been to jail, you know what I'm talking about. (laughs) Pastor Javi could go through it with you. Um, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's shady. He's back there teaching ownership people. <laughs> oh, man. I just drove that bus right over him. Boom. Anyway, so bad thing about being on staff here, we don't just drive it over. You'll hear that beep, 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 beep. We'll back it up, too. So nothing but the truth, so help me God. Now, our country, it's hard to believe this anymore, but our country got that from the Bible. It's amazing how many things that our country got from the Bible that people are trying to take out of our country. But it started pretty good. I think it ought to finish pretty good. So the person taking the oath is swearing by someone greater than they are. So in essence, what God is saying is, if, if, if I don't tell the truth, or when you go put your hand on the Bible, you're saying, if I don't tell the truth, then God's going to take care of me. God's going to take care of this. 
And God comes to Abraham and he says, I want to cut covenant with you or I want to make a deal with you. And I want to take an oath to let you know how I'm going to do this. So I'm going to swear to you. And I know you're not supposed to swear, but, but, but I'm going to swear by someone greater than you. Because I can't think, God's saying, I can't think of anybody greater than me. So if it's okay with you, I'm going to swear on my own name and on my, and on my own calling to make sure that this covenant never gets broken, man. And, and so well, my question is, would it be okay with you if... If God made an agreement with you this morning to bless you and that he swore that he, he put his own name on the ticket to make sure that it came to pass, would it be okay with you if God made covenant with you this morning? Is there anybody here that's sitting there going, no, I don't want to be blessed. I just don't want it. I, in fact, if I get one more blessing, Pastor Todd, I'm just going to fall over and die. I've just got too much encouragement in my life, and I've got too much blessings. If anybody tries to encourage me, I'm going to punch them in the face. I just can't take any more. <laughs> Would it be okay with you if God, if God encouraged you and God blessed you? Yeah. Come on, man. That's a good place right there. Why, Todd? Thousands of years later, Hebrews saying, in the same way that God swore to Abraham, he's swearing to everybody in this room. He wants to bless you. The same verse in verse 17 in the New American Standard says, In the same way God, desiring even more to show the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose. In the same way, look what that scripture said. In the same way I swore to Abraham, but even better. Somebody say, Mo better. Even more better, in the same way that God came to Abraham, he comes to the heirs of the promise. Okay, well, who are the heirs of the promise? Because a lot of times we're thinking that he's just talking to the Jewish people. And, and he is speaking to the Jewish people, but he's also talking to everybody in this room. If you've named the name of Jesus as your Savior. Romans 4 says this, verse 13. For the promise that he would be uh, that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. Galatians 3.29 backs that up and he says, if you are Christ. In other words, if you are saved, if you've named the name of Jesus, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So that means everybody in here can get up underneath this covenant of blessing. Oh, that's so good. That's better than the way you're acting. I'm just telling you right now. That is a good promise. If I believe in Jesus and now I'm connected to him, I am an heir according to what the Bible said. Now, let me tell you why that's great. Because if somebody on the street tells me that, I don't know if I can walk that out. Because people on the street sometimes don't tell the truth. But when God says it, I believe it and that settles it in my heart. So you can't tell me that I'm disqualified when God just told me I'm qualified if I call upon his name. Now, that means a lot to me because I know where I came from. Some of us get saved and we forget where we came from. You get saved and you forgot that you used to be smoked up and doped up. Used to be locked up. But now you've been made free. How dare we get saved? And then when people come to church, we got to... Mm. I wish I didn't sit by them in church. They smell like, a, they smell like cigarettes. I'd rather them smell like cigarettes than smell like hell. Y'all not ready for me. I can see this already. <laughs> Pastor Todd, I'm pretty sure the person I'm sitting by is still a little hungover. I can smell the alcohol in their breath. Yes! <laughs> I would rather them be drunk at church than passed out at home. Why? Because here I can get seed in onto them. I can pour seed into them, and the Bible says that seed never comes back void. You're not hearing me. If your church don't smell like a pool hall and a club every now and then, you ain't got much of a church. It don't mess me up. They opened their door, Pastor Todd, and beer cans all fell out. Hallelujah! They're at the right place. Come on, somebody. Why do you say that, Todd? Because beer cans never fell out of my car because I know my, somebody would have told my mama and my mama would have snatched me. <laughs> but I was smart enough to throw them out before I got to church. <laughs> 
but I'm so thankful that I was still in his presence so that when I got older, I knew that even though my church came down harshly and taught some things that were out of consistency with what I thought about God, the seed had been planted that God is good all the time. I want you to catch the weight of Hebrews chapter 6. This is what God says to you. I did not come to judge you or condemn you. I came to bless you and I swear it to you. That's what God's saying this morning. I swear it to you. And I'm going to confirm it with an oath. And I'm going to confirm it with two things that cannot change. And God said, it's impossible for me to lie. And this is what we just read, Hebrews 6. So what are those two unchangeable things? They talk about it all the way from Hebrews chapter 7 to 10. But here's number one. Jesus is our high priest forever. Jesus is our high priest forever. Hebrews 7, 17 says this. For he testifies, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Also, dropping down to verse 23. Also, there were many priests. Now, this is crazy. There were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, talking about Jesus, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Jesus is our high priest forever, ever, and that's unchangeable. Whether you like it or don't like it, Jesus is the high priest forever. Now, let me show you uh, verse, uh, chapter 10, verse 11 of Hebrews. Th- this is crazy. Yet every day, priests still serve ritually, offering the same sacrifices again and again sacrifices that can never take away sin's guilt. But, somebody say but. But But when this priest, talking about Jesus, had offered the one supreme sacrifice for sin for all time, he sat down on the throne at the right hand of God. And the reason he sat down is because it's finished. It was complete. And he remains our high priest forever. And that is immutable. And that is unchangeable truth. Jesus, by the grace or or by grace, by the righteousness of faith, not law, Jesus is now my high priest forever. Now, Hebrews 7, we read these priests were prevented by death from continuing. In other words, they would die. They would offer up a sacrifice and and everything in their life wasn't right. So they would die. They would kill over. And and that means they had to keep finding priests. If I was one of them, they, hey, you want to be priest today? Like, shoot, no, dog. Everybody dying over there. I'm good. I'm just going to stay in my tent. (laughs) I'm good. They had to have a bunch of them. But this new priest, we only need one. Come on. This new priest. Because he's going to live forever and he's never going to die. And he doesn't need to offer the same sacrifices over and over again because he offered one sacrifice for all time because that sacrifice was perfect. And then he sat down and it is finished this morning. That's good news for everybody then. So all the sins I did before I got saved, are they under the blood of Jesus? Yes. Yes. What about the ones that I've committed since I've got saved? Are they under the blood? Yes. yes. What about the ones in the future? Yes. Oh, we, some of us dropped out right there. <laughs> Somehow, e- e- either y'all don't believe it or you're planning something really shady here in the future. <laughs> <laughs> one or the other, like Pastor Todd, I don't even know if this is going to pass or not. But <laughs> Yes, they are. Why? Because he offered one sacrifice for all time. See, if I had a good week last week and I didn't mess up, is Jesus still my high priest? Yes. Okay. What if I had a bad week? Is he still my high priest? Yes. Okay. See, we say yes, and, and, but what we do is we act like we're close to God when we do everything right and we do everything good, and we're not close to God when we blow it and we fail. Hear me on this. I 100% understand that we don't, that we don't walk in that, but here's what we do. God, I'm sorry I was so bad. I'm sorry I blew it, and so I'm going to beat myself up all week, and then we're going to be even. I'm just going to I'm just going to constantly rehearse all my failures all week and talk about how sorry I am and how terrible of a person I am, and just and then we'll be even. Can I tell you, you won't be even? Are you following me? My sin, my sin doesn't change who Jesus is. But my sin undealt with changes who I am. 
but if I confess my sin, that changes everything and keeps me in right standing with God because he did the sacrifice once and for all and it doesn't matter where I've been and it doesn't matter what I've done. If I confess and believe on him, I can be saved. That's good news this morning. Here's the other thing that's important for you to know. Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant forever. Hebrews 8, 6 says this, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry in as much he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Now, do you believe the new covenant's better? Yes. Well, y'all, y'all need some help in here. I'm, I hope so. Yes. Yes. Do you believe it has better promises? Yes. Oh, see, y'all are getting so much better. Praise the Lord. Now, let's, let, can we list those? Do we know what those are? Aha, aha, like that guy, on old man on Coming to America. <laughs> taste the soup. <laughs> I don't want to taste the soup. Taste the soup. <laughs> I don't want to taste the soup. Taste the soup. There's no spoon. Aha. <laughs> aha. <laughs> anyway, I watch too much movies, man. Pray for me, man. Remember when Eddie Murphy went up there to sing? You're so lovely. Give yourselves a hand, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> sing it on <laughs> Y'all don't remember all that? Did y'all's parents not love you at all? Come on, man. Hebrews 9. My parents did love me. They didn't let me go to the movies. Bless God. <laughs> well, I was a heathen, and I went. <laughs> Bless God, too. So Hebrews 9.9. 9. It was an illustrated, uh, illustration that was pointed to our present time of fulfillment demonstrating that offerings and animal sacrifices had failed to perfectly cleanse the conscience of the worshiper. I want you to catch that. The sacrifices that had been offered up till Jesus didn't cleanse the conscience. Now that word uh, is talking about being perfectly complete in every area. Verse 13, under the old covenant, the blood of bulls, goats, and the ashes of a heifer were sprinkled on those who were defiled and effectively cleansed them outwardly from their ceremonial impurities. Yet how much more will the sacred blood of the Messiah thoroughly cleanse our conscience? For by the power of the eternal spirit, he has offered himself to God as the perfect sacrifice that now frees us from our dead works to worship and serve the living God. This is so good. So Jesus is the one who has enacted a new covenant with the relationship with God so that those who accept the invitation will receive internal inheritance he has promised to his heirs. For he died to release us. This is powerful. Catch this. He died to release us from the guilt of the violations committed under the first covenant. Going on to chapter 10. The old system of living under the law presented us only a faint shadow, a crude outline of the reality of the wonderful blessings to come. Even with its steady stream of sacrifices offered year after year, there was nothing that could make our hearts perfect before God. For if animal sacrifices could once and for all eliminate sin, they would have ceased to be offered and the worshipers could have been clean, uh, have clean conscience. In other words, if the law could have made their conscience clean, we wouldn't need to keep doing sacrifice after sacrifice. The law could not do it, but Jesus had to only do it once, which means he can take care of all your shame and guilt and you don't have to walk around with a conscience that seems dirty over something you did back then because the salvation he provides is so wonderful and so secure that not only does he take care of your sin, he'll cleanse all the shame and all the guilt over your life. That's a better covenant. So if you're here this morning and you came in with a dirty conscience, if you came in with shame and guilt, I can tell you that's not the love of the Father. Well, Pastor Todd, at my last church, they told me, I don't care what your last church told me, told you. Go by what the Bible says. I don't care what Pastor Todd tells you. Don't go by Pastor Todd. Go by the word, and the word says, I don't have to walk around in shame and guilt. Once I've been forgiven, I've been forgiven. What people do, people like to rehearse your past. They like to bring it up all the time. I just tell people all the time, that was my then, this is my now. Well, you did this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Blah, 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 blah. I did all of that. 
But that was, man, that's 27 something years ago. I had a guy one time tell me, well, I'll tell you what, you wouldn't be preaching at the worship center if there would have been um, Google and everybody could search your name for back in the day of what you did wrong and this wrong. And we we would have Googled you and they would have known who you are. I said, fool, they don't got to Google me. I tell them every Sunday at church. <laughs> That's who I was. That's not who I am. I said, the difference between me and you is I got 2-7 behind my name. What's that 2-7? 27 years of living it out. You can't even live 27 days. That's the difference. I got, <laughs> I got a track record that I ain't as stupid as I used to be. Yeah. Yeah. Mama, say amen. amen. That's my baby. Anyway, so, <laughs> praise the Lord, I'm not there anymore. The law couldn't do it. Jesus had to, uh, uh, only Jesus could do it. And he's the only one that can clear your conscience. In other words, if something doesn't take away your guilt and your shame, then you're going to serve God out of dead works. If you don't realize that that blood has forgiven everything, you are going to serve God out of dead works. Remember last week we talked about the hamster (laughs) on the wheel? You'll spend your whole life on that hamster wheel thinking you're going somewhere only to find out you're going nowhere. And, and, And a dead work, watch this. What's a dead work, Todd? A dead work is any work that's not initiated by God. So sometimes we do good things that aren't God things. Come on, I'm gonna bring this freedom to somebody right now. Sometimes we do good things that aren't God things. Uh, and we, don't, we gain God's approval through grace by faith, not by works. Now, this talks about being conscious of sin. So stay with me. This may shock you, but one time I heard a preacher say this, and it really irritated me. I heard a preacher say, you know what problem with the church today is that we're not sin conscious enough. We need to be more sin conscious. Conscious, and I want to say I 100% disagree with what that pastor said. And let me tell you why. I think the problem with the church is that we are too sin conscious. Stay with me before you judge me. If Jesus has cleansed my sin, instead of being sin conscious, what about being grace conscious? We're more known for what we're against than what we're for. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do this, don't do that. What about being Jesus conscious? What, what about instead of always thinking about all my failures, what about if I start thinking about all the successes that God's done in my life? What if I start thinking what he did for me? What if I start celebrating the fact that I've been clean for 27 years and talking about being dirty before that? Come on, somebody. What, what if I talk about what he's done now? Instead of talking about Bud Light, I saw the light. Come on, man. Why don't we talk about that? Why don't we talk about being moved from from sin to being moved to grace? From the pit to the palace. Eh? Why don't we celebrate that? Well, Pastor Todd, my life was a message, a mess. Yes, mine was too, but I thank God that Jesus' blood come by and made it a message. And I'm tired of talking about what I did. Let's talk about what he's doing and where I'm going. Come on, celebrate that this morning. Do you realize you become what you spend the most time on? You become what you focus on the most. If all you focus on is all your failures, you're always going to be a failure. You don't need anybody to beat yourself up. You'll beat your own self up. The problem is we've only been taught that Jesus' blood saves our sins. What I'm trying to tell you, Jesus' blood also takes care of your conscience. It takes care of the shame and the guilt. It's not that you didn't do it. You did it. But you don't have to rehearse it the rest of your life. If, if, if you're rehearsing it the rest of your life, that means you've gone back to the old law. And you're, you're, you're depending upon them to go sacrifice another bull and another goat every day. But Jesus said, I did it one time for all time. So that you don't have to rehearse your past over and over again. That's good news this morning. Amen. See, that's what the law does. It, it, it says don't do this and don't. And what happens when you tell somebody don't do this? They pretty much going to go do it. You tell your kid, hey, don't touch that. What's your kid do? (laughs) And you're like, don't touch it. And you're like, I'm not touching it. I'm just getting really, really close. Getting as close as I can. Like my mom used to tell me, uh, somebody, we have like dessert. We have like a pie for dinner. And she goes, don't eat that pie. I'm like, oh. I didn't even know we had pie until you tell me not to eat it. 
So the fact that I ate it, I feel like 90% of the responsibility is on you because I didn't even know we had it until you went around telling me. <laughs> and now I'm in trouble because you said don't do it. Like I would have never done it until you brought it to my attention. Now I got to do it. <laughs> I was that kid. Anybody with me on that? Yes. You don't put pie in front of a fat kid and tell him not to eat it. <laughs> don't eat that pie. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to eat that pie. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Blueberry or cherry. Woo! It'll change your life. Anyway, <laughs> focus, listen, don't focus on the don'ts. Focus on the love of God. Focus on Jesus. Focus on walking with God. Focus on loving God. Focus on serving God rather than the don't, 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 don't. I, I'm so tired of going to churches and everybody knows what we're against, but does anybody know what we're for? I'm for second chances. I'm for two millionth chances. I'm for, I don't know what the next big number is because I can't count, but whatever that number is, I'm for that kind of chances. That's the kind of God I serve. Over and over again, his grace is poured out. Here's the second reason the new covenant's better. It's because it's based on faith and not on works. God compares the Abraham covenant, which is based on faith. He, he came to Abraham and he said, I came to bless you. And God deposited righteousness in his account. We talked about this last week. You, you understand, when the Bible talks about the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, it's not talking about the Abraham Covenant. It's talking about the Mosaic Covenant. The Abraham Covenant is compared to the New Covenant because it's based on faith, not on works. The Mosaic Covenant, which has passed away, Hebrews tells us, was based on works. Now, I want you to visualize this. God came to the children of Israel, and he said, Hey, guys, I want to make a new covenant with you. Where one person has a part and another person has a part. And so here's what God said. God said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to be your God. That's my part. Okay, got it. And they said, got it, coach. You know, got it. And, and the children of Israel said, got it. And God said, okay, here's your part. You got to keep the law. Every part of the law. And in fact, there's going to be the chapter in Leviticus. I haven't even wrote it yet, but when I write it, there's going to be a, if you get a scab, I'm going to tell you what to do with that scab. Yeah. So, anyway, so he said, I'm all that. And he said, I'm going to write chapters on the law and you got to be perfect in every part of that law. You understand that? The children of Israel go, okay, got it. And we'll laugh about that. But do you realize we do the same thing? Do you realize the children, they broke that law on the very first day. They didn't even make 24 hours and they busted it. They already broke it in the first 24 hours. And, and, and here's the thing. Some of us have been, been believers for 20 years and we're still trying to be perfect rather than to receive his grace. We're still trying to operate under an old covenant and we laugh at them and, and sometimes we're not even a believer anymore and you're still trying to be perfect. That's old covenant. So, Todd, what is the new covenant? Let me tell you, I'm almost done. I'm out of here. God came to me in the Sunday school room in Pampa, Texas in 1991. And he says, I want to make a covenant with you. He said, Todd, here's my part. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to protect you. And I'm going to provide for you. And I'm going to be your God. That's my part. He said, Todd, do you want to know what your part is? I said, yes, Lord. He said, Jesus, would you come here? He said, Jesus, this is Todd, and I want to make a covenant with him. But I was wondering, because Todd is flesh and Todd's messed up, I'm wondering, could, could, could you do Todd's part? Would you go to earth, and would you be a man, and would you live a perfect life? Would you keep all of the law, every part of the law, Jesus, and would you never break it? In other words, would you live for Todd? And Jesus said, yeah, I'll do that. And God said, but Jesus, there's one more thing. Todd is going to break the law, and the penalty for that is death. So would you also be willing not only to live for him, but would you be willing to die for him? And Jesus said, yes, I'll do it. And, fall, and then God looked back to me, and he said, do you believe if Jesus does all of this that it'll be enough? Would you put your trust in the fact that not only is Jesus going to die for you, but see, we put all of our, fact, our, our truth into that, but he's also going to live for you. And if you'll put all your trust in that, would you, he'll be willing to redeem you from everything. And 27 years ago, I said yes because he said yes, and now I'm here today. That's the new covenant. 
That's for everybody in this room, man. When you, get, when you decide you want to make him Lord of your life, he goes to Jesus every time. Would you be willing to do this? And Jesus is like, not only would I be willing, I've already done it. It's already been provided. So I don't have to be perfect because he already was. He lived that way. He died for us and he raised again. But what I do when I sin, I don't run from him. I run to him. Because his grace is just that good. The question is, some of you have been into that new covenant. My question is for me, like Todd, 27 years I've been living this now. 27 years later, do I still believe what he did on the cross is enough? If you've named the name of Jesus, do you still believe what he did was enough? And if the answer is yes, my question is, is why are you walking around with your head hanging so low? If you believe that covenant is so strong and so secure, why do you beat yourself up every time you fail? We spend so much of our new life trying to convince God we're not who he said we are. Who are you? Who are you to stand up to the man that made you and try to talk him out of who he said you are? That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. That's like in my house. My 18-year-old son walk up to me where I pay the rent, (laughs) where I pay all the bills, where I buy all the groceries, where I bought all his furniture and all of his clothes, pay for all of his gas and all of his insurance and gave him my truck for him to come and tell me, hey, you know I'm the head over here, right? What I know is, I'm going to give you grace because your mama here. <laughs> but your mama going to go on a mission trip, son. And daddy going to lay hands on you. He ain't going to pray. <laughs> and he say, why? I say, how are you going to talk me out of what I know? <laughs> I just take my stuff and leave. Well, you ain't got much to take because I, I own it all. Pastor Ty, you throw it down like that. Don't you make me no guest in my house. I'm 18. Well, you ain't, you ain't grown if you're still living at my house. You're not ready for me. Grown means you pay your own way. You pay your own bills. Somebody says, don't ruin it for me, Pastor Todd. I got a good thing going at my house. Stop it. My parents said, you just preach the gospel. Don't preach your parenting. Don't do that. Preach Jesus. Tell you what Jesus said. Jesus said, spare the rod, spoil the child. <laughs> Jesus said, spank, Todd going to spank, boy. <laughs> Let me get back to this. Why do you spend your life trying to tell God that you're not who you are because of where you failed? That you can't do what he's called you to do because you failed. When his covenant and who he is is unchangeable. That means if, if, if what I said this morning can't be changed, why are you trying to talk yourself out of the benefit and the promise? Are you hearing what I'm telling you? It's a shame. It's a shame that we never truly believe what God has said about us. And so we never do what he's called us to do. I read my Bible that when he that the son set free is free indeed. That means I'm not bound by my past. I'm not bound by what I did. Yes, I did it. No doubt I did it. But what I've done is not who I am. I've been made a new creature in Christ Jesus that gives me strength. Do you believe that this morning? I want every head bowed. What's the Holy Spirit saying to you right now? Ask him, Lord, what's my takeaway? What are you trying to say to me through this message? I spent way too much time beating myself up spent way too much time talking about all what I can't do. Lord, I'm ready to become who you've called me to be. I'm ready to become who you've called me to be. I'm tired of living in shame. 
and I'm tired of living in guilt. When your word says this morning that you've given us a better covenant that has cleansed our consciousness and I don't have to go around beating myself up for anything I may.